a year ago today, I preached a message that I'm going to preach a similar message this Sunday around Christmas. And God really got a hold of Dan's heart, spoke to him, and the Lord really challenged you to do something that all just got completed yesterday. Why don't you just really briefly tell them what you, Lord, laid on your heart, what you actually have now seen come to pass. I, I got this funny idea that I wanted to see a comic book gospel. And it just seems stupid and impossible and far away and I should push buttons and fill out forms and write emails. And this question occurred to me, it was, if there's a calling, how will I ever know if I don't try? If I don't let go, if I don't see what God will do. And yesterday, yesterday God did something pretty remarkable. And the funding arrived and the book will publish and what will come of it, I don't know, but I'll tell you what I do know. I worship God. I allow God room in my life to make change, to do what he wants, and he moves the world. So by the end of this month, you're going to see a comic book of the first chapter of Matthew that he officially got funded on Kickstarter yesterday. So that's pretty cool. But I want to ask everybody to bow your heads, close your eyes. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Everyone say, Dear Jesus, speak to my heart, change my life, in Jesus' name, amen. Today I want to read from Matthew chapter 1. So if you turn to Matthew chapter 1, but before I even read from that, I, I want to highlight one of the most famous uh, stories of Christmas in the Bible. And it's Luke chapter 2, verse 8. You don't need to turn there. Stay in Matthew chapter 1. Uh, but this will be familiar to you. It says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Other translations, in fact, your Bible might say, I bring you good news of great joy that is for all people. Well, today, I have some good news for you. And that's this. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you are from. It doesn't matter what you've done. Christmas is for you. And today, I want you to understand that when those angels announced, I bring you good news of great joy, that this Christmas... This is good news for you. So now I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 1. I want to share with you what is my favorite Christmas story in the Bible. Now immediately when you look at Matthew chapter 1, you are thinking, wait a second, Brandon, this is a genealogy. This is the part of my Bible reading that I tend to skip over or speed read, I, the genealogy is your favorite part of the Christmas story? Well, it is. And I want you to follow along here. It says, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. It says, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. I mean, just take a moment. Just close your eyes. I want you to picture a great Christmas carol, a picture like a choir singing, O little town of Bethlehem. As I read this, Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac, the father of Jacob. So, you know, little town of Bethlehem in the background, uh, Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Notice how even trying to hum or think the little town of Bethlehem doesn't make this genealogy more interesting. So you're probably thinking, well, Brandon, seriously, what is Christmassy about this? Well, here's what is interesting is Matthew, when he tells his gospel story, 
he starts off immediately with these three Jewish superstars. I mean, if you were going to make a Hebrew Hall of Fame, you'd have these three guys, their statues in it. You'd have Abraham, who is the father of the nations. You have David, who is their great king. And the Jewish people believed that the promised Messiah would sit on David's throne, that he would come and rule in righteousness and justice. So from the outset, Matthew is making an argument to his audience. You see, the book of Matthew was written to a Jewish audience, and Matthew is trying to emphasize to them that Jesus has the legal right to be the Messiah, that he has the legal right to to be the king, that he is the sent one, that he is the savior. So he's reminding his audience that Jesus has the legal right to be who he says he is. And then over the next 17 verses, Matthew takes a moment and he tells us the grand story of the entire Bible. So he tells us God's providence to the people of Israel over 2,000 years, and he does it through these names. And what you need to do is pause for a moment and say, out of the thousands of names that Matthew could have chose, why did he choose these names? Well, Matthew, when he did this, I could picture as he was thinking, who do I want to use? What examples do I want to use that leads to the Messiah? And as he wrote these names down, I bet he did it with kind of a twinkle in his eye. I bet he did it with a little bit of a smirk as he wrote these names down. Because he wanted to remind you and I for generations that Christmas is for you. Now remember the grand story of the Bible. God creates this world, this perfect place, and he creates a place with the opportunity to men to have perfect relationship with God and each other and with nature, but man didn't want that world. We wanted life on our own terms, so we went our own way, we disobeyed God, and when we disobeyed God, we introduced sin into the world. And when sin was introduced to the world, it damaged everything. It damaged our relationship with God. It damaged us ourselves. It damaged creation. It damaged our relationships with each other. And all of the difficulty that you and I see in the world today was because of that decision that was made. When we decided to live life on our own terms, that decision is what introduced all of the hatred and jealousy and racism and sexism and oppression and injustice and evil that's in the world today. That was all because of that choice that was made, that we wanted to live life on our own terms. But Matthew is reminding us through this genealogy, that God loved us too much to leave it that way. God made a promise. He said, I'm going to make everything right. And he chooses a man by the name of Abraham. And he says, Abraham, I'm going to bring you from a place that is known to you to a place that is unknown. But here's what I'm going to do. I am going to bless you so that you can be a blessing someday. And so he takes Abraham and through this list of the first 14 names that we read, we read from Abraham all the way to David. And this is a reminder to you and I that God keeps his promise, that he made a promise to Abraham, that he fulfilled his promise. He took care of Abraham. He blessed Abraham. He makes Israel a great nation. And he delivers the people out of slavery in Egypt. And he brings them to the promised land. And he gives them this great king by the name of David. And he rules this land in safety. Church, that is good news. 
So Matthew is saying, hey, this gospel, it is good news. When the angels came, they said, I bring you good news of great joy that is for all people. And so those first 14 names are to remind you and I that God is a promise-keeping God. Then we read these next 14 names. And we go all the way from David to the Babylonian exile. And we are once again reminded what happens when the people of God don't do what God says. And we're also reminded that even though the people choose their own way again, does God say I'm through with you? Does God say I don't want anything to do with you? Even though his people walk away from him, he says, I made a promise, and just because you weren't faithful doesn't mean I'm not going to fulfill it. Church, that is good news. All the way from David to the Babylonian exile, we see that God is faithful. He doesn't walk away from his people, even when his people walk away from him. Good news. And some of you hear me say all this, and you're thinking, oh, Pastor Brandon, I still prefer the other Christmas story. I mean, the other Christmas story, I mean, you got shepherds and angels and wise men. Uh, this is more like a history lesson in Hebrew history. Well, then, from the Babylonian exile, the next 14 names, all the way to Jesus. What is the story here? Well, we're reminded again that God hasn't forgotten us. That he hasn't forgotten you. That you might be here today and you feel lonely. You feel worthless. You look at your life and you think, does anybody care? You know, the holidays are so unique for so many people because for some, it is their favorite time of year. The holidays are all about food and presents and family. And it's like they circle this on the calendar and they cannot wait for the month of December because it seems like they go from one Christmas party to the next and one fun church function to the next and they look forward to it. But at the same time, you are likely today surrounded by some people that this is their least favorite time of year because this is the time of year where they're reminded that um, I had a marriage that blew up. This is the time of year where they're reminded, uh, man, I'm estranged from my kids. Maybe they're reminded, we just don't have enough money. And you're sitting here today and you're wondering, does God even know I'm here? All these people, they're singing these Christmas carols. They're so happy. Does anybody even know what I'm going through? And those last 14 names remind us that God is, has not forgotten us. So over and over again, in this period of history, God would send them prophets. And these prophets would just remind them, God knows where you are. He knows what you're going through. And he has not forgotten you. The prophet Isaiah lived during this time. And often God would use Isaiah to speak an encouraging word to the people. In fact, uh, around Christmas time, we're reminded about one of Isaiah's prophetic words in Isaiah 9, 6. In fact, this particular scripture, you see it all the time. You read it on Christmas cards. You see it on billboards. We sing it in songs. It's going to get quoted at churches across the world in this season. And it just reminds us, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. You see those last 14 names, God is saying, you know, I am a promise keeping God and I have not forgotten you. And it concludes with Jesus showing up we celebrate that day on Christmas morning, the day the Savior comes to our rescue. Church, why is this genealogy such a big deal? Because 
It's divided into three sections of 14 names, and each section reminds us good news, good news, good news. And all along, God is saying, man, I'm not going to leave you broken and lost. I sent a Savior, Jesus. And from Abraham to David, and from David to the Babylonian exile, it all leads to Jesus, a Savior, come to our rescue. So Matthew is telling us this grand story, first to say Jesus has the legal right to be the Messiah, to be the King. He's telling that to his Jewish audience. But secondly, through these three sets of 14 names, this grand narrative of the Bible, where Jesus comes, he is saying, this is good news for you. So no matter where you're at, today might be your very first time at church. I want you to know, I bring you good news of great joy that is for all people, not just people that have made every good decision that they could possibly make and never messed up. But this is good news with great joy for everyone. No matter what you've done or where you've been, it is for everyone. Christmas is for you. Uh, But the question you should ask is this. Why did Matthew choose these names? Out of all the names... Why did he choose these? Because when you read through there, half of these names you probably don't recognize, and the the ones you do, you probably would pause and think, hmm, I don't know if those were the names that I'd pick. But you need to understand who Matthew was. You see, Matthew was a tax collector. And in the time of Jesus, uh, there was really no worse occupation you could have than to be a tax collector. He was the worst of the worst. In fact, throughout scripture, whenever they would talk about the great sins that people would commit and the great sinners, um, the list would usually go something like this. Uh, There's liars and cheaters and murderers, adulterers, thieves, scum, and tax collectors. You see, tax collectors were some of the most unscrupulous people Uh, in the entire world. You see, they would bid out their job to Rome and they would collect taxes from the Hebrew people and they would pay those taxes to Rome, but there was really no rhyme or reason to the amount of tax they would collect from people. Um, Basically, they would size you up. They would look at you and they would determine how much money they could bilk out of you. And then they would give, they'd charge some tax from some people and more from other people. But whatever they could get from you, they would collect and they would always take a percentage for themselves and they would send the rest off to Rome. And tax collectors were infamous for being unfair. They would live in communities that were totally poor, but they would live large in these communities. They were seen as greedy. They were considered traitors. They were materialistic. Matthew was a tax collector. Matthew was a guy that people whispered about. Matthew was a guy that everyone knew and no one liked. Matthew was scum. But one day, Matthew heard about Jesus. And he heard the message that Jesus was sharing to everyone, this message of love and forgiveness and this message of eternal life, this message that was for everyone. And Matthew begins to think, you know, it probably is for everyone, but there's no way Christmas is for me. Man, I'm not just a bad guy. Man, I chose to be a bad guy. But Matthew, like many of us, And he longed for the love and he longed for the forgiveness that Jesus talked about. And he hoped that, you know, it would be great if Christmas was for me. But remember, Matthew lived in a culture that was very works-based. They determined 
if you were righteous or not by living according to these rules. And when Matthew looked at his life according to those rules, Matthew knew he was bad. But one day, Jesus shows up where Matthew works. And he says, Matthew, come follow me. And what does Matthew do? He does it. And uh, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 10, we read about this encounter that Matthew has with Jesus. And he goes, Jesus goes with Matthew to Matthew's house, and they're eating dinner together. And it says, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, uh, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him. Well, why do you think? I mean, who do you think, when, when you're scum, who are your friends? Your friends are scum. I mean, that's all the people that will hang out with you. So Jesus says, Matthew, let's go to your house for dinner. Bring all your friends. So Matthew's like, my friends are rough. I mean, all right. And so he brings all of his tax collector, and as uh, the Bible says, his sinner friends came and ate with him. Oh, yeah, and Jesus' disciples came. And then it says, but when one of the Pharisees, these were the people that lived their life according to those rules, that considered themselves righteous because they obeyed all of these rules. And they, they see Jesus eating with the scum tax collector Matthew and all of his, you know, hoodlum friends. And they say, when they saw this, they asked the disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? That was the way that Matthew was viewed. Matthew was viewed as scum. But in that moment, Jesus showed him love and he showed him forgiveness. And when Matthew writes his gospel, he just can't get over it. Man, he cannot figure out why Jesus chose him. I mean, Matthew, throughout this whole gospel, is trying to let you know, Jesus chose me. Man, I am one of the least likely people to ever get saved, but he loved me. Have you ever been in that moment where in the middle of church, in the middle of a worship service, you looked around and you saw all these people and you think many of them, they have their life together and you know how messed up you are. And in that moment, you are in awe because He forgave you. And the story of Jesus from the gospel of Matthew is this reminder that this is good news of great joy for everyone. So this was Matthew's way of saying, Christmas, man, it was for me. And you and I, if we were to go through uh, our family history, and we were to highlight people that may be in our lineage that we were related to, we would probably be very careful to talk about people that were impressive. Um, My dad is half Italian, and he's half English. Now, when people talk to uh, most, uh, most of my family about who we're related to, my dad will very frequently highlight his English relatives. Because um, our English heritage is kind of impressive. In fact, we have relatives that came over on the Mayflower. In fact, they have one of the first houses that was built in Plymouth. In fact, that house still exists. It's the Howland House. And you have to prove through your family tree that you are a Howland. And then you get to be a part of this elite society called the Howland Society. And only people that are a part of the Howland Society can visit the Howland House and through uh, my relatives, I mean, we were related to George Bush and uh, the Rockefellers and all of these different people. Now, that I don't know where any of that money went. I don't ever see any of that, but we're related to all of those people. So we highlight the English side of our family. It's impressive. We don't talk that much about the Italian side. Now, the Italian side is all of the mobsters and hoodlums that we're related to. So normally when you tell your family tree, you bring up the people that make you proud, not the people that uh, you're a bit embarrassed about. Matthew chose 
some of the most questionable people and the most questionable stories. So now let's look at it. So he said, Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Okay, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. So Matthew goes out of his way to highlight the bad part of the story. And he does this to remind us that Christmas is for us. You see, the story of Judah and Tamar, um, Judah and Tamar, they kept secrets. They were liars. They were cheats. Let me just tell you a little bit of the story here. So Judah was one of Jacob's 12 sons. Um, Jacob had a favorite son, a guy by the name of Joseph. He loved Joseph. Joseph was his favorite. He favored him, and uh, the other brothers hated him because of it. And so they actually schemed together to have Joseph murdered. And Judah, though, got this grand idea. He thought, let's not have Joseph murdered. Uh, Let's sell him into slavery and at least make some money off of this. So uh, Judah and his other brothers sold Joseph to a slave trader, and Joseph ends up in Egypt. And they concoct this great lie to tell their dad. And they kind of pinky swear that for the rest of their life, they are going to maintain this lie. And so they had taken Joseph's coat that his father had given him off of Joseph. They killed a wild animal and took the animal's blood and put it on the coat. And then they brought it back uh, to their father. And they said, uh, your son Joseph was killed by a wild animal. Okay, so that is Judah. And for years, Judah and his brothers keep this secret. And have you ever told a lie? Have you ever told a lie and kept it a secret for a really long time? You know what happens when you do that? It like eats away at you. You know, holding on to a lie, um, you say one lie and usually you have to make up a bunch of other lies to you know, keep this lie going. And after a while, it erodes your character. It creates guilt. And in the end, everybody finds out. In fact, here we are 3,500 years later, and we're still talking about this lie that Judah and his brothers created. Well, what happens for Judah as a result of this lie, it erodes everything in his life, spirals out of control, and eventually... Judah has three sons, and one of his sons marries a woman by the name of Tamar, who's referred here in Scripture, and the son who married Tamar dies, okay? In Hebrew times, though, um, they took care of widows, and just like today, back then, widows would become um, some of the most impoverished people in society But in that culture, they had a way to take care of widows, and it was called the kinsman redeemer. And that was this concept that um, the next oldest son must marry the woman who was widowed. So Judah goes to his next oldest son, and he says, hey, uh, the kinsman redeemer law, you need to marry Tamar. But the problem was the next oldest son was like the worst in the family, and he wanted nothing to do with Tamar. So Tamar eventually keeps harassing Judah and saying, what am I going to do? Who's going to take care of me? And so Judah agrees to have his youngest son marry Tamar. But his youngest son was now too young to be married. So he tells Tamar, you just need to wait until my youngest son is old enough for you to marry him and we'll take care of you. Well, Judah is a liar. And so he has no intent to have his youngest son marry Tamar. And after a while, Tamar's like, he's lying to me. This is never going to happen. Who's going to take care of me? Who's going to provide for my family? So she 
concocts a scheme. So Judah, one day, is off on a business trip. And he's away from his family, and he's off by himself. What happens sometimes when men who are liars and are secret keepers go off by themselves on business trips? Sometimes bad stuff happens. So Tamar hears that Judah's off on this business trip, and she arrives early, and she shows up at the place where all the prostitutes hang out, and she dresses herself as a prostitute. And lo and behold, Judah shows up where all the prostitutes are hanging out, and he sees uh, Tamar but doesn't recognize Tamar and is attracted to her, And they begin to talk, and they negotiate a price for them to have sex. And Judah says, the problem is, um, on this business trip, I didn't bring any money. So he says, is there some sort of collateral that I can give you? And Tamar says, why don't you give me your staff and the ring that's on your finger? And when you go home, you can send one of your servants and... He'll give me the money that you owe me, and I will return the staff and the ring to you. So what happens? They do their business. They do their, uh, gives her the ring and gives her the staff. And Judah goes home, and Tamar takes off her prostitute clothes and washes herself up, and she heads back too. And after a few months, Tamar announces that she is pregnant. Well, Judah is irate. He's thinking, my son, my widowed uh, daughter-in-law somehow got pregnant by another man. And he is furious, and it's an embarrassment to their family. And so Judah gathers some of his men together, and he says, I want you to go kill Tamar. And so as these men approach Tamar to kill her, Tamar stops them, hands them the ring and the staff and says, you go to Judah and you tell him the owner of this ring and this staff is my child's father. And they go back to Judah and they present the ring And the staff and Judah says, bummer. But that's the people that Matthew highlights, Judah and Tamar. And we read that uh, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. This is in the line of Jesus Why does Matthew tell the story this way? Because Matthew's trying to remind you that if you are a liar, if you are a cheat, if you are someone who keeps secrets, Christmas is for you. I bring you good news of great joy for all people. Christmas is is all about forgiveness, that a Savior comes to our rescue. And God made a promise to Judah, and he doesn't take it away, even though Judah does all of these bad things. Church Christmas is good news. It's not based upon what you've done. It's based upon what Jesus has done. So let's keep going on in the story. Uh, Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Aminadab, Aminadab, the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of Salmon. Hmm. Salmon, the father of Boaz. Now we're starting to get to some familiar names. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Now, some of you are probably thinking, I've heard that name Rahab before. And this is the last story that I want to tell you. What is the story of Rahab? Well, you remember that 
God led the Israelites out of captivity in Egypt. And eventually, a man by the name of Joshua is leading the Israelites into the promised land. But before they can enter into the promised land, they have to conquer the city of Jericho. And Jericho was massive, and it was incredibly fortified. In fact, in those days, Jericho was famous because it had huge walls that surrounded the entire city, and it was believed that you could not penetrate this city. So Joshua knew that to go into the promised land, he needed to conquer Jericho, so he sent some spies into Jericho. And when those spies entered Jericho, they met a prostitute by the name of Rahab. So Rahab had a title. Throughout the Bible, she's known as Rahab the prostitute. And the way that we view prostitutes today, magnify that by about a thousand. And that's the way they were perceived back then. But Rahab, this prostitute meets these Israelite spies and she begins to ask them, she says, I've heard about your God and I've heard about what your God has done for you. I've heard about how he rescued you from captivity, how he parted the Red Sea and you guys walked across on dry land and God done all these miracles and he, he has delivered and saved you. And, and she looked at the spies and she said, is there any way that there's room for someone like me with your God? Or someone who's messed up morally? Um, the spies go back to Joshua and they tell Joshua about Rahab. And they march around Jericho and the walls of Jericho fall down and the, the city is crushed except for the place where Rahab lives. And after they conquered Jericho, they brought Rahab to Joshua, and Rahab says, is there room for someone like me amongst your people? And Joshua's like, God forgave me. He can forgive you. Come. And uh, now this is where I tell you a little bit of the Brandon version of the story. I don't really know. We don't get very much backstory, but uh, I like to say it this way. Salmon, who's one of uh, Joshua's fighting men, um, they're hanging out around a campfire, and he sees Rahab, and you know he's been pretty intrigued by Rahab because he kind of likes her raw faith. I mean, this is a girl who got saved from a lot, and she is like unedited in her faith. Have you ever met anybody like that? I mean, they're just so raw in their faith, and that was Rahab, and Salmon, I mean, he hasn't seen a lot of, you know, followers of God that are like her, and so he was intrigued, and so one day, he walks up to Rahab, and he says, hey, you know what, I'd like to get to know you better. Would you be willing to go do coffee with me, and Rahab, uh, unbeknownst to Salmon, had kind of been checking out Salmon, too. She was impressed by his character, and she says, sure, I'll go to coffee. And so, you know, they go to Starbucks and they get themselves a pumpkin spice latte and um, they drink coffee. They have a great conversation. It's kind of one of those moments where, you know, they looked at their watches and they're like, wow, five hours is gone. Man, we have so much in common. It's so easy to talk to you. And uh, Salmon looks at Rahab and says, hey, we're kind of hitting it off. Do you want to go on another date on Friday night? Man, I want to take you to this great restaurant called Applebee's. Man, they have great appetizers there. And Rahab's like, yeah, let's go. So they go on another date, and eventually they fall in love. They get married, and they eventually have kids. And did you know Rahab, the prostitute, someone who is messed up morally, that she is the great, great grandparent of King David. Why does Matthew tell us the story of Rahab in the genealogy of Jesus? Because he wants to remind us 
that even if you are here today and you've messed up morally, you've made mistakes, you've done things that you are embarrassed about, Christmas is for you. Even if you have a bad reputation, I bring you good news of great joy for all people. When the angels came and they announced this, and it was for everyone. And the reason that I love the story of Christmas from Matthew's perspective is that I'm reminded that Christmas is for me. That even though I'm not perfect, even though that I've messed up and made mistakes, uh, Christmas is for me. And today I want to remind you that I bring you good news of great joy for all people, even notorious people, even secret sinners, even those with a past, even those that are unfaithful. I bring you good news of great joy. Church, Christmas is for you. You see, Christmas is when we're reminded that God became man to rescue us and save us. And he came not just for the righteous, but he came for the sinners. And have you noticed that any time an angel shows up, he always says, don't be afraid. And that's a reminder to you and I that we can come to Jesus and we don't need to be afraid. He can take our sin away and he can exchange it for his righteousness so that you and I can have joy. I want to close the service today by inviting our worship team to come up and they're going to lead us in this uh, famous Christmas chorus. And so I want to invite everyone to stand up on your feet and I want during this Christmas season you to be reminded that the message of Christmas is for you. And let's take a moment together and remember Jesus and adore him.